Hello, everybody. How are you doing? How many of you are coming here for the first time to a Spark Summit? All right. There's a majority of the audience. Welcome. This is a great. For me, I think it's the sixth one I'm speaking at. And you know, you watch the keynotes, and it seems like every year they show cooler and cooler things. We can process more data. We can do it faster, cheaper. We can do really exciting machine learning and AI. And at some point, this question about well, whether everything we do is actually something that we should do comes along. Right? Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, all kinds of issues about privacy. There's certainly something to think about when all this data comes together and when inference with machine learning and AI can really do pretty amazing things, sometimes by accident. All kinds of examples of systems misfiring. People in California a couple days ago had guns drawn on them because the car they had rented for get around was uh, listed as stolen. And it was stolen at some point, but then it was recovered, except the database of stolen vehicles wasn't uh, updated. So those kind of issues to think through here. And we're not going to take the Uber view of privacy. We're going to take a very practical view that relates to the work you do every day in data engineering, machine learning, and AI. And we're going to try to teach you some techniques that we've discovered in our companies that care a lot about privacy for making data processing, machine learning, and AI better, both better from a privacy standpoint and better from an accuracy standpoint as well, which seems strange, but is actually, but is actually doable. My company is Swoop. We do petabyte scale privacy preserving machine learning and AI over health data. We work with pharmaceutical companies and doctors to improve patient outcomes, improve business effectiveness. I don't know how many of you know, but there's a thing called rare diseases, the diseases that affect fewer than 200,000 people. There's about 7,000 of them, and in total, they affect about 30 million people. They're very difficult to diagnose because when most doctors went to med school, many of these diseases didn't exist. So it's very difficult for somebody to diagnose a disease that don't know it exists. So on average, it takes many years and visiting more than half a dozen specialists to figure out that you have one of those things. Half of them affect actually children. So it's very, very important work to be able to do this well, to be able to figure out who, for example, may have an undiagnosed disease, help the doctor diagnose it, but obviously, it's dealing with very, very sensitive data. It's health information, and we need to be very careful about it. I grew up in communism many years ago. I wasn't much privacy in communism. And so once you live through something like this, you usually either end up kind of not caring about privacy or end up really, really caring about privacy, you ended up really caring about it. And I'm here with my friend Slater Viktorov, who's a machine learning expert and whose company, Indico, also deals with some pretty sensitive data. And I'll pass it on to Slater so we can tell you about it. Everyone, uh, this is my second Spark Summit, but the first one was great, and hoping this one will be even better. Uh, as, as Swoop said, we deal with a lot of unstructured data to kind of sum us up in, a, in an instant. Um, when you have a process that involves documents, so a very small amount of text that you have to analyze, likely has a lot of PII in it, think uh, bank statements, loan applications, how do you process that while maintaining really, really high efficacy at very, very low data volumes. Uh, similarly, privacy is absolutely critical in everything that we do. If we use traditional approaches to tackle this text data, uh, we end up running afoul of some really big privacy issues that you know, we, we feel pretty uncomfortable with. So we've been focused on this problem for probably about five years, really specifically on, on really the text space and low data. So in the second half of the presentation, we'll be digging a lot into sort of the new science of text embeddings, exactly what that gives us in terms of privacy guarantees, and how we can kind of get beyond this mentality that text is too hard to de-anonymize, and so we must throw it out, which is kind of a pretty, pretty common point of view. Uh, so that's about, that's about us. Yeah, uh, yeah, Sim, you're better for this part. So I don't know how many of you are following what's happening in Washington and California uh, and Washington, D.C. and Washington State, but following Europe's GDPR, there's a huge push for both federal and state-level privacy regulation. The California Consumer Protection Act comes into effect January 1st. It will affect how you work with data because if you work at a company that does any business in California, it will affect you. Now, in the case of GDPR in Europe, many companies pulled out of Europe altogether, um, particularly US-focused companies. Uh, it'd be very difficult for US-focused companies to pull out of California. California is one of the world's largest economies, if you treat it as a country. And um, 
fundamentally, it's a very, very complex and moving landscape. If you deal with a lot of data, if you touch anything related to people, you need to be focused on this, you need to be keeping track of it because independent of what the lawyers will do and what business people will do, you don't want to end up in a situation when somebody someday says, hey, you know, we need to make a big change to the way we process and handle data. And look at it and say, well, it's going to take six months. And say, well, actually, regulation goes into effect in two. Right? You really don't want to be in that situation. There's a legend, there's a myth out there that you can have privacy or you can have machine learning and AI accuracy. And that's basically false. It's based on very um, outdated assumptions. If you're actually willing to invest sufficiently in technology, you can have great privacy and you can have great inference accuracy when you model. But it's a matter of really caring and thinking about privacy by design as opposed to privacy as a bolt-on on top of something that we want to do and people sort of acting upset that we now have to worry about privacy as opposed to just crunch data however we want. There's some really exciting work going on at the edge of privacy-preserving computation. And the summary of this slide is, this is great stuff to read and be excited about, but none of it is ready to handle large data volumes at reasonable cost today. Differential privacy introduces some noise in the results of queries or during machine learning model training to essentially um, make the results a little less precise. Um, Encryption-based models such as fully homomorphic encryption essentially let you perform operations on data that's fully encrypted. If you can represent your problem as logic gates and are willing to take, a, you know, thousand to a million times slower processing, then maybe that will work for you. That doesn't work for us. And the protocol-based systems, such as secure multi-party computation. There's actually some very, very interesting work there in the image space. There's a project called Shift coming out of MIT that essentially partially trains neural networks uh, in several locations. And then they essentially cut training at a certain level, do an exchange across the locations, and continue training. It's a very interesting approach. It's an open source project on GitHub. And check it out if you're dealing with images. Slater and I are not, so we're not going to talk about visual data in this talk. We're going to talk primarily about structured data and unstructured text, although the technique that Slater is going to talk about actually can be applied to images very, very effectively. So what do we do when all this exciting research work isn't ready for prime time? Well, when the algorithms are not ready, what we do is we sanitize the data. We make the data safe to work with. So the rest of the session, we're going to talk about how to sanitize a single data set. And then in the next session, we'll talk about how to sanitize across data sets and how to handle unstructured information. So what does it actually mean to sanitize data for privacy? Well, privacy, again, is this really big thing. It's like climate change. How do you even talk about it? Here we'll take a very simple and practical view that privacy is about anonymity. It's OK to know that something happened. It's not OK necessarily to know who did it. Right? So if that's the definition of privacy, if privacy is about anonymity, about indistinguishability, then the enemy of privacy is identifiability. So Let's think about the spectrum of identifiability, right? The simplest cases, we have personally identified information. We know what happened, and we know who did it. The next level is that we have device-identified information, right? Think something with cookies or device IDs, mobile advertising IDs. We know what happened. We know the device that did it. We don't necessarily know the human behind it. Now, there may be additional techniques, data sources, vendors you can use to get to a human from a device. but Assuming you don't do this, you have device-identified data. If you work with those people and get to sort of human-level identity, then you're back to personal identified information. And there's a third pole, kind of the, the best level of privacy. is We know what happened. We don't know who did it. Is the identified information. There may be an identifier that we know identifies somebody, but there's essentially no way to know who that person is. Now, these are the types of identifiability. Let's talk about the sources of them. Well, the first obvious source is direct identifiability, right? Here's your personal information. And the way we sanitize this is by replacing the personal information with pseudonymous identifiers, using a combination of hashing and encryption to defend against various types of privacy attacks. Think of privacy like security. You talk about the likely attacks against it. You know, nothing is 
perfect if you have an omnipotent uh, opponent. Even data that is de-identified for almost any other purpose could actually become identifiable if you have unlimited budget and unlimited access to other data sources to, to put around that data. So let's think about exactly how this happens. Well, so we start with the personal information. And the first thing we notice is that in the real world, personal information may have slightly different representations across different systems. So the first thing we want to do is we want to come up with some consistent canonical representation. Here, just for an example, I stringified the fields in a particular order, and I separated them by pipe. Then we want to get rid of this information, so we're going to hash it using a secure hash function. Any of the SHA function families will do fine. At this point, we've replaced the personal information with an opaque token. And you think we may be done. We're not done because of rainbow attacks. How many of you know what a rainbow table attack is? All right, a few of you. A rainbow table attack is a brute force lookup attack. Let's say that um, I hash some phone numbers, and you want to figure out how my tokens match to phone numbers. Well, they're not that many phone numbers, right? There's seven digits. Even if you add country cons, they're not that many phone numbers. There are not many ways you can represent the phone number canonically before hashing. And there are not that many hash functions people will use. So you could brute force build a table that hashes every possible phone number in all the simple canonicalizations you can think about using every possible hash function that you think I could have used. And then you'll probably find a lot of matches with my phone numbers. Now, there's two ways to deal with this problem to, to break rainbow attacks. One is you salt the hashes. The other one is typically used in industry when building pseudonymous IDs into encrypt. So you take a secret key you'll never share with anybody, and you encrypt the hash. Now, lookup table attacks no longer apply. But we have another problem. We're still not done. The problem is that every single piece of data that has these pseudonymous identifiers is going to have exactly the same identifier for the same personal information coming in, which may or may not be OK. Imagine that we're a data provider, and we work with multiple partners. We give data to partner A, and we're OK giving them the data because of whatever other data they have around it. And we give data to partner B, and we're OK with giving data to partner B because of whatever data they have around them. But now, because the identifiers are the same, sorry, I did not press apparently enough. Um, they can actually join their data sets, which we'll see later in the session can actually be a problem. So we may want to exert control downstream over how data can be joined, both across entities that use data and sometimes even across data deliveries for the same entity. So what we do is we encrypt again whenever we need to break joinability. Right? Typically, it's done by partner, but sometimes, if you want really, really, really safe delivery, you would encrypt with a randomly generated one-time key, and then you throw away the key. At this point, even multiple deliveries to the same partner cannot be joined together. Right? Why would you do this? Well, you do this by thinking about the use cases you want to support. Right? The more privacy-safe your data, the more sanitized your data set, and the less opportunities people have to re-identify people downstream using whatever mechanism, the greater freedom you have in processing the data. Right? So based on your use cases, you choose the approach you take. Now in the real world, there's another problem, which is dirty data. When I was in college, at one point, I was receiving the same paper catalog. I'm old. 11 different, sort of under 11 different variations of my name and address which is kind of funny. Not only were they killing trees, but you know, wow, that many misspellings. Right? So what you do is you tend to generate multiple tokens. You generalize some of the data. You fuzzify it to increase the chances that two slightly different things, canonical representations, right? a slight misspelling of a name, et cetera, that are probably the same person end up looking the same. Now, you won't always be right. There'll be false positive and false negative errors because this is a heuristic, right? But you look at your use cases, and you tune your canonicalization rules based on the costs of false positives and false negatives. Now, keep in mind, academic research makes the horrible mistake 
to assume the false positive and false negative errors are equally costly. Hence, you have metrics in machine learning such as AUC, area under the curve. Well, guess what? In real life, in business, false positive and false negatives usually do not have the same cost. So you really want to think carefully about how you evaluate sanitization to your specific use cases. So let's figure out how to do this in Spark. And now I'm going to do the thing you're not supposed to do, which is do a live demo over a public shared Wi-Fi connection. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Hmm. Anyway, to switch to the other screen. There we go. All right, let's zoom in to make this readable. Soup runs on Databricks, so this is a Databricks notebook. So this demo is going to assume that we have access to, let's zoom one more level. Is this better? Everybody can read it? Excellent. We're going to assume we have access to four user-defined functions. Two of them are actually really needed for the computation. Two of them are just to make the code for the demo simpler. The first one is we need a way to hash using a good secure hash function. Strangely enough, Spark doesn't have a built-in function for this. The default Spark hashing function is murmur-free, 32-bit, which is great but not good enough for this. Second thing we need is a way to, whoops. That's showing the markdown. We don't want to see that. Second one we need is we need a way to encrypt data. Interestingly, Hive has an AES encryption function. And although Spark ported almost every single function from Hive, they did not port encryption. There's an aborted open source pull request that, um, you know, with no explanation why it was aborted. So it, just a few lines to add. That's why the one we use here has two underscores. Just to avoid a name conflict, this Spark actually guessed it. Are there any committers in the audience? I'd really love to know why there's no built-in encryption function in Spark. The other two, again, literally just to make the demo code prettier. One is how do you get a human passphrase and turn it into a secure binary key? In a real production system, you generate um, random binary keys for encryption. And the second one is a simple function to use for our canonicalization, which is going to grab how many columns we pass to the function, and we're going to separate them with a pipe. Right? Nothing fancy there. So let's create some personal identifying information. So in this case, basic, you know, first name, last name, date of birth, gender, where do I live, and let's add me to a one-row data set. Now let's define our canonicalization rules. So the first one will take all the information as this. These are defining columns. So we're going to uppercase the first name, uppercase the last name, take gender, date of birth, and zip as this. In the second rule, we'll take only the first letter of the first name and the sound X of the last name. Let's also define our columns. We have two rules. We want to generate two columns with pseudonymous IDs. And this is simply a way to do it in a flexible way, such that if you get 10 rules, you generate 10 columns, and they'll be called PSID 1 through PSID 10. Now, let's also identify, do some quasi-identifiers. Quasi-identifiers are information that, that are attributes of people that don't uniquely identify people, but maybe enough of them do. For example, gender, age, birth date are quasi-identifiers. So in this case, Let's throw some in and let's show examples of how we can generalize some. So we'll generalize date of birth to year of birth, and we generalize zip code to just the first three digits, to the prefix of the zip code, to increase the granular, so to make it larger geo pools. Okay? So now that we have both our quasi-identifying columns and zero ID columns, we can project the data, combining these two column sets, and that will be our sanitized data set. Let's transform the input data with that and display it, see what happens. Well, there it is. Here are quasi-identifiers, and here are the very long tokens. Now, keep in mind, this is binary data. The Databricks notebook displays it in base64, but it's actually a binary column in Spark. Now, well, let's move on. Now, let's do the partner-level sanitization. We want to be able to encrypt per partner. Let's assume we have a map of two partners, A and B, with their own special passwords. And then we're just going to grab the IDs and replace them in the data set, encrypting 
and also Base64 encoding for convenience. Since unfortunately so much data still gets exchanged using text delimited files, it's never a good idea to be keeping binary data around for data sharing purposes. Uh, when we do this, we now see that the token for partner A and for partner B are going to be different, just as we expected. Last but not least, we can actually combine sanitization in a single function for a partner using our sanitization and then customizing for a partner. This is function composition in Scala, nothing, nothing fancy about it, though the syntax looks a little weird. And we can have a single transformer to apply to our data. That's literally all there is to it. So now that we know how to deal with direct identifiability by replacing personal information with pseudo-anonymous identifiers, let's look at how to deal with identity based on quasi-identifiers. I don't know how many of you know this fact, but people are a lot more identifiable than maybe initially thought. In fact, this research changed the way the census was done and reported because they identified people from the publicly government release census data, which most definitely was not trying to let people be identified. The way we sanitize quasi-identifiers, the framework of thinking about it is k-anonymity and various variations such as t-closeness, l-diversity, and so on and so forth. The basic notion of k-anonymity is that if you think about a data set where one row is about one person, that no matter which way you slice and dice the data, you can never get to fewer than k rows. Well, the simplest way to think about it is if you want to figure out the level of canonymity in a data set, given a list of quasi-identifying columns, you group by the quasi-identifying columns, you calculate the count of rows in each group, then you select the minimum count, and that's your level of k. That's the smallest group size. If it's one, it means that some combination of quasi-identifiers get you down to a single person, a single row. There are also versions that add noise to that, right? Rather than just removing quasi-identifiers or generalizing them up, like we did with birth date to birth year, k-epsilon anonymity also injects some noise just like differential privacy did. But it's less commonly used. So how do we do this in Spark? Well, here, the news is not that good. First problem is that canonymity is an MP hard problem. It means that it takes too darn long to compute an optimal solution. An optimal solution in the sense of one that for the same level of K anonymity achieved loses the minimum amount of information in the data set. So we have to use approximations. One such approximation is an N log N approximation called the Mondrian algorithm. I've been able to find only one open source Spark implementation it is not production ready. It gives you an idea of what the algorithm does. You could use it for your own purposes, but it's not ready for prime time. Good news is there's a lot of exciting research in the area, both for faster algorithms using locale sensitive hashing and a risk based method, and specifically about spark focused implementations. I've seen research work from one university in Turkey and one university in Australia that talked about specific Spark-oriented implementations using the in-memory architecture that work really, really well. But no open source code yet. I've reached out to the researchers, haven't heard back. If they share any code, I will update it in the slides that get uploaded for the conference. We are kind of ahead of time, so maybe we should just roll through. How about it? All right. So. In this not quite second session, um, we'll have great time for questions at the end. Oh, well, let me actually stop. Any questions you want to ask now for what we've shown so far? Um, I'm, I'm coming from kind of the same background. Uh, we have to deal with a lot of privacy, uh, privacy data. Um, uh, you were talking about um, that uh, you could, with AES, encrypt uh, the right personal data. 
uh, to a level, but um, what to do with a key, like for data that you would have at some point to be anonymized for a certain computation. So you don't want to throw away the key, but um, what do I do with the keys? So that, that's another point of attack. So the question is, what do you do with the keys that you encrypt with? It's a very good question. I should have mentioned that a lot of this de-identification often happens by third parties that are effectively clean rooms. Right? They don't care about the data and what the data means. They're just focused on the IDs. And um, they manage the keys. Or in some cases, actually, you want to throw away the key. Right? If you absolutely never, ever want to make it possible to go back for whatever reason, you want to throw away the key. There's some use cases where you do want to go back. For example, in the health space, re-identification is forbidden by HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability Protection Act, Portability and Accountability Act. Um, but re-identifiability is allowed by, for example, a hospital for patient benefits. But hospitals already manage both health information and personal information. They have all the policies, security, et cetera, to do this, so it's okay. Typically, big data processors live outside of hospitals, outside of insurance companies, and they're not allowed to do this computation. Great question. Any other questions? For any other questions, I'd request that, uh, could we use the mic in the middle? Uh, regarding K anonymity, do you have to know in advance which, which fields, like, okay, is it gender and date of birth, or? You do, are, you okay. do. It's one of the problems with the approach, and it's, a, and it's an issue that actually goes away when you use some of the technique that Slater's going to talk about. In K anonymity, you have to pick your quasi-identifiers. And so there's a judgment call there. How aggressive do you want to be? So I'm sure with a lot of the data that you're dealing with in order to you know, improve diagnosis of rare diseases, a lot of the data that you need in order to train your ML models and that you're using as features are quasi-identifiable. So if you apply these approaches and you try to generalize your quasi-identifiers, how are you not sacrificing accuracy? It's an excellent question. We'll talk about it in what we call the second section. Obviously, within a single data set, right, you have to achieve a certain level of If the data is already there, right next to each other. You know, you, you have to make it safe for processing. Um, the problem actually becomes a lot harder when you have multiple data sets. And we'll talk about how to, um, how to avoid making it a lot worse. Any other questions? Hi. So Hi. Um, I've seen a few systems that actually deal with K anonymity at query time instead of uh, at this initial like um, storage time. Absolutely. Um, do you know of approaches for that, and like, is that reasonable? I do not know of this. I know of, of systems that do differential privacy at query time. Uber has an open source project, and the issue there is that um, you basically think of it as a SQL, right? So you're going to execute some query and you want the results to have noise injected to a point where they're safe, however safe is defined. The trouble is that nobody has come up with a system that can handle arbitrary queries. Because while SQL is not exactly Turing complete, uh, it's pretty darn close. Um, so you can formulate queries that are so darn complex that are, that are very difficult to analyze. So if you sort of want to attack, imagine somebody publishes an API and says, oh, I have an amazing protection system, here's a public API, query my sensitive data, a smart attacker can probably figure out how to get to it. The, the advance of what Uber did was that they expanded it far beyond what other people had shown to that point, which is basically counting, you know, group by and count type queries. Other questions for now? All right, we'll just, we'll just roll through. So, how do you deal with this problem of sanitizing joinable data set? Well, the industry standard is to say, well, if the data is joinable, then the worst possible thing you can do is join it all together. So let's assume you did, and we effectively sanitize based on the union of all the quasi-identifiers. Right? The problem is you end up with the greatest possible increase in the number of quasi-identifiers. 
Now, why, is that, why is that an issue? That's an issue because sanitization, believe it or not, has its own curse of dimensionality. You're probably familiar with the curse of dimensionality from machine learning, which causes all kinds of problems with inference and performance. Here, the curse of dimensionality is different. The problem with too many quasi-identifiers in sanitization is that to achieve a desired level of canonymity, you end up just losing a huge amount of information. So how much? You know, Slade and I were thinking how to give you a sense of this, and we decided to use a toy example. So we'll take the Titanic passenger data, very commonly used data set, and we'll k-anonymize it using different values of k, using two groups of quasi-identifiers. One time we're going to look just at age, and the other time we're going to look at age and gender. Keep in mind that gender adds essentially only, only doubles the size of the tuples of quasi-identifiers. So, so it's, you know, the smallest possible increase you can think of in a, in a categorical data set. And we're going to measure information loss using a metric called the normalization, normalized certainty penalty. Don't worry about what it means. Worry about the fact that it goes from 0 to 100%, and higher values means you lost more information. Now, ready to see what happens? Here's what happens. Age is the blue curve. Age and gender is the purple curve. So for low values of k, they're basically the same. Everything seems, you know, no issue. We can just sanitize as much as we want, just keep adding quasi-identifiers. But then, at 9, it gets different. There's a 300% increase in information loss. Why at 9? It's just how the data set works. And this is the problem with this. You don't know what you're going to lose ahead of time. And there's a bigger issue, right? If you're on the receiving end, you don't even know what was lost. I mean, somebody can tell you the normalized certainty penalty is 23%, but you have no idea what this means for your use case. So the fundamental issue with this traditional centralized approach is that you end up with data that describes some alternative reality, some parallel universe that is not ours. And when machine learning and AI make fateful decisions, this can cause a lot of problems. As a famous study, where they train machine learning model to determine the correct amount of drug that should be given to patients at different levels of privacy. Warfaring is a blood thinner. And they found out that at high level of privacy, the results would be detrimental to patient health, which is kind of a really big deal. And this is the kind of research from which the mythology of you can have accuracy, you can have privacy comes from. But we argue it's based on this implicit assumption that you're assuming centralized sanitization. And conversely, you can think of a single data set and say, well, maybe I have too many quasi-identifiers in the single data set, and I'm losing too much information sanitizing it. If you could break it up into data sets that are never joined, you would actually have a lot less information loss across the data sets. So what we need is we need a different approach to sanitization. We need a federated sanitization approach. And here's what this might look like. This is our own foundational privacy platform. Uh, for us, it's kind of built under the data layer, almost. It, it's not a bolt-on. It's very fundamental to what we do. And the idea is simple. You start with these isolated execution environments where data and code live. How isolated? I mean, think like separate business subsidiaries, separate cloud accounts, separate administrators, passwords, et cetera. You literally cannot move data between the two without the data being inspected by this automated task-specific sanitization firewalls. So rather than sanitizing the data once for any possible use case, which forces you to over-sanitize, you say, no, no, let me look at what exactly you're trying to do here. Maybe you're trying to featureize data for machine learning training. Maybe you're trying to calculate an aggregate count of something. If I know exactly what you're trying to do, I can come up with a sanitization strategy that achieves the desired level of privacy very often without any loss. So 
So let's say that we want to do a model on some health condition, and we have health data and we have other data, and we never want health data and other data to mix. What could this look like? So in our system, this could look like this. You essentially are going to do two machine learning models, one on the health data and one on other data. So first, you're going to train something to predict condition X, say, on the health data. That's here. So you have health data, you train a model, its predictions are some scores for the condition X, and you have a de-identified patient ID. When you're moving it, you go through this task-specific sanitization layer. You can move the patient ID and the score. You don't need to move the health data. In fact, you could even change the name of the score column to not mention condition X, because machine learning cares about numbers. It doesn't care about the meaning of the numbers. Condition, a column named condition X score is actually contextual health information. What you're saying is every score there applies to condition X. That information may not be necessary to follow on training. Right? And then you can do a regression down here with other data against the scores. Obviously, you could say, well, maybe that's not as good as doing a single stage model against the exact conditional information, say a classifier. I say maybe. But the flip side is the only way to do that with health data and other data is if you very aggressively over sanitize both. And if you're dealing with large data sets with lots and lots and lots of potential quasi identifiers, the effect can be exponential in the information loss. So it's not at all obvious. In fact, in some experiments we've done dealing with third parties that can actually look at the data fully, this results in far better accuracy and far better privacy. So, so far we've talked about structured data. Now there's no framework for handling unstructured data. And since we have a minute to the end of the talk, Slater will talk to you in the next session after the break about how to deal with text and images and all the other things that don't neatly fit into our number or categorical variable. Thank you so much. <laughs>